Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, great to see everyone on this on this bright, sunny day when I saw how beautiful it was. And it was yet another global warming day. I was worried that folks would uh, would find something else to do. But um, <laughs> welcome to the, to the first uh, spring 2023 Global Economic Governance Book Talk uh, hosted by Boston University's Global Development Policy Center. My name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm a professor at the Pardee School, and I'm the inaugural director of the Global Development Policy Center, the GDP Center, as we like to call ourselves. Our mission is to advance policy-oriented research on financial stability, human well-being, and environmental sustainability across the world. We ended 2022 uh, with a great conversation with our own Perry Merling, who's here, uh, on his book that is both an intellectual biography on, Kenneth, on Charles Kindleberger and of the dollar at the same time. And we're really excited to kick this year off with Professor Jamie Martin of Harvard University on the origins and history of global economic governance. Uh, before I start, since I see a bunch of students here, the GDP, one of our signature programs is something called the Summer in the Field Program, where we pay for you to go abroad for the summer. We think it's important for folks to get experiential learning uh, on development. You can go work on your master's thesis, your PhD thesis. You can be a master's or an undergraduate student who is working for an NGO in the global south. Our applications are due on March 24th. We have a couple of these cards that you can get in the reception area. We're going to have a little reception after this to find out more about it. And we're actually having an info session about this at the GDP Center on yeah, sorry, on, we on Wednesday, February 22nd at, at noon. Uh, free lunch? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Glad I didn't uh, get in trouble. Free lunch, February 22nd. You come hear some of the people who've been recipients of this in the past and, um, and find out more about the program. We're 53 Bay State Road, the last BU building uh, on this side of the street uh, all the way down. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask Professor Martin to give a short overview of his book. And then I prepared a few questions of my own. And then the last 25 minutes or so of this hour will be questions from you. So start thinking about them now. And uh, when you do ask questions, one of our colleagues will come with a microphone for you. Not because we can't hear each other in here, but we're live streaming. We're, we're recording this so folks can, um, can look at it on our YouTube channel. We'll have a short reception immediately following the, the event. Well, as a recovering economist who tries to be a historian, a political scientist, a lawyer, and a climate scientist when I'm not practicing the dismal science. I can say that this book fills a major gap in the historical literature on global economic governance, and therefore it will also help us make better global economic policy today. I highly recommend this book. The way the history books tell it until this one came around, and the way that I teach it in my courses, which some of you are in here, and so I'm guilty, <laughs> is that after World War I, the gold standard pr proved to be incompatible with the rise of democracy and with stable economic growth, and it was abandoned. The gold standard was an implicit form of global economic governance without governments because countries were forced to deflate their economies into recession and repression in order to adjust to a new equilibrium. As Kindleberger showed in his classic book, The World in Depression, there was an attempt to try to put this back together in 1933 to come up with a new order but it collapsed based on different weaknesses of England and the rising power of the United States. Then, we almost always fast forward to 1944, up to the Bretton Woods, uh, up the street to Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, where New Dealers and John Maynard Keynes are said to have worked to create a new system that was compatible with stable economic growth, but also full employment and democracy that, this is controversial, worked pretty well for, for some, at least for the center, for a certain period. Martin shows signs of failure early in the 1950s. Other argue, others argue that when it really becomes widespread is the 80s and 90s. And the consensus is that the system is now broken and in need of reform, uh, given the two major crises that we've had of this century in 2008 and the poly crisis that we're in the middle of now. Whether it be Janet Yellen in her speech last Thursday, uh, Guterres at the at the United Nations, the China People's Bank of China, uh, or uh, Prime Minister Mia Motley and the emerging Bridgeton uh, initiative that there's widespread calls for reform now. Jamie Martin in this book shows that it's wrong to fast forward from the gold standard to 1944. That indeed the origins of the current global economic governance regime trace to the economic arrangements that the Allied powers constructed during World War I and its aftermath and to the League of Nations, 
that 1944 was a, an attempt to break from those institutions, but in many ways it didn't live up to those expectations and became very similar to, same, to some of the same kinds of policies that we found at the League of Nations and even its predecessors. To bring in a book by another former colleague of ours at the Party School, Cornell Bond, some of you might remember, he shows that the diffusion of 20th century ideas uh, was a function of reframing, grafting, and editing the same stories to get the same ends in different venues in different countries across time. Martin shows how the fundamental tenets of the World War I system, the League of Nations, and eventually the IMF in some ways, uh, were to provide financing for participating countries on condition that they expand markets, keep them open during downturns, and that during downturns, participating countries get financing conditions on the same kinds of policies that, had, that the gold standard inflicted on their populations. The one key difference is that everyone bought into these things because the rules would not pertain to the powerful Anglo countries, but only to the vanquished and the weak. Martin follows the intense political conflicts provoked by the early international efforts to govern capitalism and shows how fraught problems of sovereignty and democracy posed by institutions like the IMF are not unique to the late 20th century globalization, but instead first emerged during an earlier period of imperial competition, empire, World War I, and crisis. So I'd like to ask Jamie to just give a short a welcome to BU and uh, give a short overview of the book. And I'll ask a few questions to get things going, and then we'll open it up to all of you folks, and so we can make it a global conversation. Please uh, introduce yourself when we do. But uh, please help me in welcoming Professor Jamie Martin to BU to talk about this book. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here. I'm such a huge fan of the work done at the GDP Center. And while I'm a historian and not a policy person, um, I follow this work closely. So truly, um, I couldn't imagine a, a better audience, um, uh, a better interlocutor. So my book, The Meddlers, offers a political history of the rise of the first international institutions that attempted to govern the world economy in the aftermath of the First World War. Uh, it shows how these institutions reshaped tools of empire from the 19th century for a new era of self-determination and growing democratization in the 20th century, and how in the process these institutions developed powers of economic governance familiar to us today, offering financial bailout loans conditional on domestic schemes of austerity, coordinating the policies of politically independent central banks, investing in development programs, overseeing commodity uh, production and prices, and so on and so forth. In order to do so, these institutions oversaw what I argue was quite a dramatic transformation in international order by cracking open the domestic economic policies and institutions of sovereign states to the intervention of powerful external actors. So in essence, the book offers a kind of genealogy for a kind of power that by the turn of the 21st century had become extremely significant and politically salient on the global stage. And one whose history, I argue, has not been um, fully documented. And the power that I'm referring to is that uh, uh, which is wielded by institutions like the IMF and the World Bank um, uh, in, the, in the way in which they are able to exert extraordinary leverage over the domestic economic policies and institutions of some states. By attaching conditions to their loans, these institutions, of course, as you all know, have overseen dramatic programs of market liberalization and austerity, trade liberalization, and so on and so forth, particularly in the former communist bloc and in the global south. Now, as Kevin mentioned, there's a common story about how these institutions first emerged and then how they were able to develop these uh, interventionist powers in the 20th century. The story begins at the Bretton Woods Conference um, of 1944, where representatives of many countries met to reshape um, the kind of rules and institutions of the global economy and, of course, to create the IMF uh, and the World Bank. Um, now, in the, the way in which this is often narrated is that at Bretton Woods, you see uh, one of the great compromises of the 20th century being reached as technocratic internationalists like John Maynard Keynes and his US counterpart, Harry Dexter White, essentially reached an agreement that was designed to allow states to return to an integrated world economy or a semi-integrated world economy, while at the same time allowing them greater freedom and policy space to experiment with new macroeconomic 
uh, regimes and welfareism on the national level. Um, on the, the kind of the common telling, this compromise doesn't last for very long. Uh, the Bretton Woods system collapses in the 1970s. And after this moment, the IMF and the World Bank are kind of out of a job, or at least they've lost their original mandates. So they begin to be mobilized for very different projects to enforce neoliberal and structural adjustment programs and to oversee the transition of nearly every former Soviet republic to capitalism. And as this happens around the world, these institutions are increasingly denounced as meddlers um, and accused of bullying states into pursuing painful reforms, often against the wishes of their citizens. Now, it, again, it's usually claimed that the political problems that are posed at this moment to conceptions of democratic self-governance and sovereignty um, are unique, that they emerge out of the unique conditions of this period of late 20th century neoliberal globalization, a time when US foreign policy adventurism is paired with extreme market liberalism um, uh, to produce these new political dynamics and to kind of fundamentally transform sovereignty. Um, but as I showed me in my book, these problems actually originate to a much earlier era. Um, and that it was at the end of the First World War, in fact, that international economic institutions begin really for the first time in history to reach into the domestic economic policies and institutions of sovereign states. Um, now, what I refer to in the book as a first wave of international economic institution building um, is, is a kind of, uh, 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 encompasses a, a, a process that has long been neglected, in part because, as Kevin mentioned, the interwar period is traditionally seen as a time of crisis, a kind of a, an interlude or an interregnum um, between different uh, international economic regimes, uh, one centered on the gold standard, and then a later one centered on the rules and institutions of the Bretton Woods system. But what I show in the book is that during this period, you, also see, you, you actually see an extraordinary um, kind of uh, dynamic process of institution building centered around organizations like the League of Nations, the Bank for International Settlements, which of course still exists to this day, and other less known institutions um, as well. And as I argue in the book, the, uh, the emergence of these new institutions and the attempt to endow these institutions with powers all confronted um, uh, uh, the same, and quite, uh, same new political problem and challenge, how to break a taboo uh, about domestic, fiscal, monetary, trade, industrial, and resource policies being insulated from the reach of external authorities. The idea is that these policies are supposed to belong to the exclusive domain of the state. Uh, and, and the kind of the process and the efforts to break this taboo represented a seismic innovation in international order, one that was akin, I argue, to the human rights revolution uh, which similarly involved a rethinking of the borders between the domestic and the international when it came to questions of how the state could treat its citizens. Now, in essence, the, the, this political problem was whether, again, these domestic economic policies and spaces of sovereign states could be open to external intervention, but in ways that would be considered legitimate practices of international cooperation and not simply new forms of outright coercion and kind of imperial interventionism. Of course, before this point, before uh, uh, the First World War, few countries outside of Europe and the United States had ever enjoyed such a robust right to non-interference. Uh, this had never applied to places brought directly under European colonial control or that had been subjected to a vast array of semi-colonial arrangements, including semi-colonial financial controls, extraterritoriality, and so on and so forth. Uh, countries from China to Latin America, across North Africa, and so on. But what I argue in my book is that it was precisely these imperial precedents from the 19th century that made the birth of global economic governance after the First World War so profoundly politically controversial. Uh, in a profoundly hierarchical world order of this time, how could any state allow external actors into its internal realms without admitting to a loss of autonomy and prestige and power in the process? So what I argue in the book is that one of the principal political challenges faced by these new institutions was to attempts to make these older imperial practices compatible 
with a new politics of self-determination and with the legal fiction of sovereign equality after the First World War. So what do I mean by this? I'm just going to give you one quick example that I get into in some length, at some length in the book. Um, so one example from the book concerns how uh, an international institution first attempted to make financial stabilization loans conditional on domestic programs of austerity, of course, what the IMF famously um, does now. Uh, this was first experimented with long before the IMF was created, uh, actually, in successor states to the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian empires in the 1920s. And these efforts involved the League of Nations dispatching advisors to national governments and central banks uh, that were essentially authorized to veto policies and domestic decision making. The aim was to try to remove monetary and fiscal decisions from what was seen as the kind of quagmire of parliamentary deadlock and political horse trading, and to try to kind of cool the pressure on fierce domestic distributional and party conflicts. In essence, the idea was to make these states that were highly politically and financially unstable attractive to foreign lenders by removing their full sovereignty. And while this was the first time that an international institution had ever attempted to do this, the basic logic of this practice dated back to the 19th century. So before the First World War, many states in search of loans had been pressured to relinquish their full sovereignty to representatives of their creditors, often with threats of violence. Uh, this involved the establishment of foreign-run debt commissions in places like Egypt, the Ottoman Empire, China, Tunis, states throughout the Balkans, the Caribbean, and Central America. And these debt commissions worked uh, essentially by removing control over sources of public revenue and economic policy making. And they generated fierce resistance, as you can imagine, nearly everywhere they appeared. But from the perspective of lenders and major uh, uh, investment institutions, uh, these debt commissions worked as intended. Countries put under this kind of semi-colonial control were considered less risky borrowers and they tended to enjoy lower interest rates. So from the vantage point of bankers looking out over 1920s Europe, uh, profoundly unstable conditions of 1920s Europe, the same logic seemed to apply. Uh, the problem was that the prospect of establishing Ottoman or Chinese style debt commissions in European capitals like Vienna or Berlin uh, appeared to pose clear threat to perceived civilizational hierarchies. And this is where the League of Nations was supposed to step in. As a multilateral and supposedly politically impartial institution, the League was supposed to um, essentially mediate the relationship of these states and their foreign creditors in ways that would keep both happy. They would kind of remove the full sovereignty of these states in ways that would keep the bankers happy, but it, they would um, kind of mask the role of these bankers in ways that wouldn't lead to outright kind of explosive political opposition on the ground. Um, so the League was intended to function as a kind of legitimation machine, I argue, uh, by transforming these old coercive tools of informal financial imperialism from the 19th century into apparently softer practices of governance and international cooperation. But there was little illusion that this was a truly explosive proposition and that the kind of origins of this kind of conditional lending um, was, was, was enormously, um, uh, uh, generated enormous resistance. Um, and even after only a few years, this practice became so politically toxic that the League of Nations had to abandon it essentially by the late 1920s. What I argue in the book though is that something, kind of a, a, a genie was released from the bottle that wasn't fully put back in. That over time, <coughs> this practice uh, was re-adopted um, and readapted in uh, different contexts. And the League of Nations, alongside other institutions, um, stood at this moment of great innovation where these once unthinkable practices of international governance were slowly and gradually becoming more and more routine ones. These practices that involved cracking open these very sensitive domestic spaces to the intervention of external actors, but in ways that were, again, supposed to be different from 19th century empire. Um, uh, of course, this was a kind of power that the IMF would itself come to wield not long after the Second World War was concluded. And then, of course, um, as, as we all know, 
um, uh, kind of power that was dramatically expanded at the end of the Cold War. So what the birth of global economic governance involved, I argue, was both the emergence of this new kind of power to intervene in sovereign domains and a new set of political justifications and explanations for how these kinds of interventions were to be distinct from old forms of empire. Um, and I, I conclude the book by suggesting that the political struggles over um, these questions and these innovations and the political struggles over these deep imperial legacies uh, clearly remain with us today um, as the world experiences um, new sovereign debt crises uh, with few tools uh, to respond to them and the kind of attendant instabilities they bring um, besides an IMF that most states, until they have little other choice, um, uh, would prefer to avoid. Um, so thank you. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. It's a great, great overview of, uh, <laughs> a, a, I don't know how many pages it is, a great overview of a, of a couple hundred pages. So you still have, you still have to read the, read the book. Um, it, it has so many in, incredible stories about it that, uh, that, that shock this re recovering economist. Uh, yeah. One is that uh, I know who Jean Monnet is. We actually have a Jean Monnet chair here at, uh, at, the par at the Party School. But I didn't know that some of this stuff was erected by him and Arthur Slater when they were in their 20s. Mm. Um, in, 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 during the war that they were, a World War I, they were a, a core component of, uh, of sort of supply chain management mm -hmm. and cartels that were created mm -hmm. by the Allied powers to be able to make sure that there were supplies of goods. Mm. Uh, to the powers and to the citizens of, of folks in, in the allied countries during uh, during the war and, and you claim that that you showed that that's sort of a the first sort of coordinated uh, inter international economic governance if I could go to the back side of that though so mm. uh, of course those of you in your 20s you're about to graduate yes you are going to go out there and, and, and rewrite the rules of the global economy but uh, but was it John Monet's and Arthur Slater's idea what where what are the ideas behind mm. this what are the mm interest groups and power dynamics that, uh, that, uh, that give these two young 20-year-olds who are about to have massive careers and erecting so many yeah. other different yeah. institutions, what, what gave the wind to their sails? What, yeah. Where does this come from? Where's yeah. this whole project that you show lasts 100 years? Like, where are they coming from? Yeah, so it's a very good question. So the, the context that Kevin was referring to is what I argue to be the kind of origins of the first powerful and effective intergovernmental institutions of economic control, management, coordination, uh, which emerged during the First World War at a moment of extreme crisis for some European members um, of the alliance waging war against the central powers. And what happens is that in part uh, because of the uh, incredibly devastating uh, campaign, campaign of submarine warfare that Germany embarks on in early 1917 against Allied and neutral shipping, that the Allies face this problem of mounting shipping losses. And none of the Allied powers are completely self-sufficient in food, in energy resources, in the raw materials needed to keep their uh, factories open and to keep you know, the production of armaments necessary for the war going. And if they run out of ships, they can no longer import the goods they need to win the war to feed their citizens and so on and so forth. So they improvise very, very quickly with the creation of these kind of intergovernmental institutions, ad hoc wartime bodies that essentially are designed to pool ships and to pool resources between the major allied powers. And really perhaps the most extraordinary innovation here is that the United States ends up joining these arrangements as well. The United States, which is kind of traditionally um, anxious about these kinds of ties, which is you know, anxious about joining the war in the first place, nonetheless finds itself by the turn of 1918 a kind of leading member of these very early kind of proto-international institutions. Uh, so what do these institutions involve? What kind of demands do they make on interest groups? Well, one thing is that the principal problem, in addition to shipping shortages, is that vital goods have simply become too expensive during the war. Everyone's competing over access to foodstuffs like wheat or vital industrial raw materials like nitrates. So they need to find a way of essentially artificially suppressing the prices of these goods so that everyone can afford them. I'm kind of you know, simplifying things here, but this is the basic problem. 
So from the vantage point of industry, you know, this is quite you know, oppressive, let's say. Obviously, their profits are being cut into. Their freedom of action is being restrained by these powerful governmental mechanisms uh, designed to kind of slow and arrest the inflationary pressures being generated by the war. So industry generally says in most of the allied countries, OK, fine, well, we're willing to accept these sacrifices so long as the war is going for the sake of the great national cause. But what you see immediately at the end of the First World War is that private backlash to the continuation of these institutions as soon as the war is over is fierce and swift. Um, so this first set of international institutions actually gets unwound at the end of the war by the opposition, the organized opposition and mobilization of private industry groups, um, uh, kind of led by the official kind of blessing of the United States government, which doesn't want to be bound uh, by the terms of these institutions when the war is over. So then in the wake of that, you see a, a, a kind of another process of improvisation, where the League of Nations inherits many of the personnel, many of the ideas, many of the kind of institutional precedents from these wartime arrangements, but then has to do something quite different. And what it ends up doing is that it ends up bringing kind of private interests back on board for a different kind of project of governance, no longer oriented around questions of global supply chains, but instead oriented around questions of financial stabilization. And that's something that very naturally and easily brings bankers on board. Uh, if, I, if I remember correctly from the book, the US condition of joining, however, was that the, that the, that the body was not going to allow the United States ships to be. Yeah. It, no one was going to tell the U.S. Navy where it could go. That they'd participate, but uh, but only only to a certain degree. And and, and that's a cross-cutting theme across the entire book. That uh, what's sort of fascinating is that in the midst of war, in the midst of a growing number of countries over the century, you have more and more countries, especially the big, powerful countries, joining into a global economic governance regimes that are bound by rules. But there's always somewhat of a, mm -hmm. a stipulation that, the, that there's somewhat of a double standard within, within the rules. And I couldn't help after having the conversation with Perry Merling last semester about his book and, and, and us at our center being observers of this of how on some level your, the next chapter of your book is written in this century, mm -hmm. which where now there's almost a bifurcation. Whereas the International Monetary Fund in the 20th century was for everybody. But now it's only for the vanquished and the weak. Whereas in this century, I, mean, I guess this is a question of would you agree with this? Mm -hmm. uh, in this century now, the industrialized countries, they go for lender of last resort services and stabilization uh, to central banks, yep. to, the, to the major central banks in the industrialized countries, which A, don't have these conditionalities, uh, and B, promote expansionary policy to recover from, yep. from a uh, uh, from a recession, whereas other, if you're if you're the weak or the vanquished, you have to go to yeah. to the IMF. Is that me adding another, taking your, th am I getting your thread right? And yeah. Would you say that that's uh, what we might, how you might look as yeah. a as a historian for the for what's going on in the past 25 years? I think it's a great point and a great context. I mean, one of the arguments of the book is that. Uh, uh, the kind of interventionist power that these institutions are able to deploy over countries is always indexed according to the perceived power and standing of the country in question. So as I mentioned in my brief introduction to the book, in the 19th century, there's a general conception that there are certain kinds of states where bondholders and representatives of creditors can exercise extensive kind of powers of meddling, <laughs> as I term it. And these states are generally limited to states, uh, to, to North Africa, um, to the Ottoman Empire, to China, to a handful of states in the Balkans, states that had only recently won their independence from the Ottoman Empire, and then over time into the 20th century, states in Latin America and in the Caribbean. And what I argue in the book is that one of the kind of big challenges faced by these early institutions of global economic governance that at least ostensibly um, thought of themselves as more universal or more globally encompassing was how to try to get other states to accept these kinds of intervention in their domestic affairs and questions about government budgets and monetary policy. 
And what these institutions realize very quickly is that European states that are not, let's say, accustomed to this kind of intervention bridle. And they say, look, we're European. We deserve more sovereignty than other states. The amount of sovereignty you're kind of entitled to um, uh, uh, varies according to your civilizational standing, according to all kinds of markers of inclusion and e exclusion in the international system. And essentially what I argue in the book is that something like that continues long after this moment um, of kind of outright empire um, of the interwar period. Something like this continues. The asymmetries built into these institutions, the kind of demands that they make vary um, according to the states um, in question. And it's no coincidence that uh, uh, the US Federal Reserve, when it makes swap lines available, um, you know, kind of unconditional emergency um, liquidity, that it only does so to some countries. And other countries, when they want to have access to US resources um, and, and uh, kind of emergency liquidity, are going to face, um, um, you know, potentially a long list of demands and conditions to gain access to it. There's no, there's no coincidence, given this, um, you know, uh, more than 100 years of history, that these asymmetries continue to exist and that the kind of autonomy and sovereignty you're seen as being entitled to by those who have the capital varies according to, you know, often quite arbitrary markers of standing and power. Two more short questions on my end, and then you folks will start, uh, start thinking, of, uh, thinking about them. You talk a lot about, Ch you have a whole chapter where China is a big, big part of the conversation, and I guess, I guess my question is, to what extent is China a slight variation to mm -hmm. your... Yeah to your story here because you talk about uh, how, you know, how utterly humiliated China was uh, in, the, in the 19th century and that Sun Yat-sen had a whole project where he solicited international finance yep. for his whole development program. But the League and others play a role there. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Henry Dexter White orchestrates, uh, before he mm -hmm. uh, yep. is part of Bretton Woods, he orchestrates an export-import yep. bank loan yep. to piggyback yep. on, on some of this stuff. Yep. Can you yeah. Tell us a little bit of the, t of the China story yeah. and the extent to which it's, it's different or manifest of yeah. the whole story. So China in the 19th century is a kind of a textbook case of this kind of informal uh, imperialism that I describe in the book. It's a country that is formally independent, that formally enjoys the status of a sovereign state, but nonetheless has its autonomy and sovereignty constantly chipped away at by foreign banks, by foreign diplomatic offices, by legal regimes of extraterritoriality, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the 20th century, you have uh, the emergence of obviously very powerful opposition to this, which manifests itself in many different ways. Uh, you mentioned Sun Yat-sen, uh, who, um, you know, kind of leading nationalist um, uh, uh, political figure who writes what has been credited uh, uh, with as being the first kind of guide to international development as we know it in 1920, the international development of China. And what uh, is argued in this book is that China needs access to foreign capital for its development, but it needs access to foreign capital on radically new political terms. That no longer can China be expected to trade off its sovereignty in exchange for financial assistance. That by contrast, financial assistance is needed to build up kind of institutions of the state in order to promote Chinese sovereignty. And it's quite a powerful vision. And what I argue in the book is that um, after the nationalist uh, kind of rise to power in the mid-1920s in China, you see an attempt to put something like Sun Yat-sen's vision into practice, where you have a nationalist-run government reaching out for foreign loans, for pro programs of state building and economic modernization in China, but constantly insisting that China will not agree to terms of loans that involve further abrogation of Chinese sovereignty, that come with painful conditionalities. And in fact, very interestingly, you see Chinese officials looking at what the League of Nations did in Central Europe and in, in Southeastern Europe in the 1920s and saying, you can't treat us in this way. We will never accept financial kind of bailout loans made conditional on these kinds of schemes of austerity. And from the vantage point of the League of Nations, kind of learning the lessons of how unpopular these kinds of conditional loans are, um, they ultimately say, OK, we'll try something different. We'll try to provide the assistance of technical experts 
for various programs of agricultural development and kind of infrastructure building, but we're not going to insist on appointing advisors that have actual powers of control over domestic policy. Now, this program only exists for a handful of years, however, because um, conditions in China rapidly deteriorate in the 1930s as war with Japan approaches, as the Depression arrives. Um, so there's something of a story of, uh, you know, a kind of almost misconnections or something like that. It's a story that has a, has a kind of tragic interruption, let's say. But it does represent a moment in the book where something new is tried, but the only reason why it's tried is because of organized and concerted opposition to the kinds of uh, kind of domineering foreign financial assistance that the nationalist regime correctly recognized you know, China would no longer tolerate. Yeah, which, we, to, which we see now. China, after the 1997 uh, East Asian financial crisis, said we will never, never go to the International Monetary Fund. And they've amassed a trillions of dollars of, uh, of dollar-denominated reserves so they can act as their own uh, inter international monetary fund. And I guess that is a, a glimmer of an interesting moment of a relatively weak but sovereign state in a, in a, in a, in a time of, of incredible concentration of power right after a world war where there is room to move or there has been some policy space. So my last question is, uh, to what extent can uh, the global south or the vanquished and the weak uh, uh, across, across history and, and across the future play jujitsu a little bit and use some of, these, uh, some of these tools that were used by empire to help, uh, help themselves rise and help themselves develop? One of, one of the stories that, you know, I'm just naive, I don't read enough history, that I was blown away by is that um, the, germ, the phosphate is what is core to explosives, and that only Chile really had it during World War One. The Germans had figured out this is all from him. Uh, <laughs> uh, people are looking at me like I'm smart. It's it's him. Uh, the the Germans had figured out a substitute for it, so they were sort of divorced from it. And so uh, the Allied powers created a cartel basically to suppress uh, suppress the prices in Chile and be able to distribute it to uh, distribute it to to, to the front, et cetera. And to me, on one level, well, isn't that the project that many of the developing countries mm -hmm. started in the 1960s? Of, of course, now all we have is OPEC, yeah. but there was a coffee regime. UNCTAD negotiated a whole bunch of, uh, of international commodity agreements that tried to use that same vessel, that yeah. same approach, but to use coalitions of themselves around particular <laughs> commodities to get a fair price from the empire. Yeah. Uh, and now we have these BRICS coalitions and all yeah. these other things. What, uh, what, to what extent do you see hope or lessons yeah. from history yeah. from the other side to use those yeah. same tools to yeah. advance yeah. forward? Well, I'm a historian, and historians are always extremely cautious about saying how their history can provide lessons. Also, the book, the kind of the most of the book place, takes place during the era of the World Wars, which is a very difficult period of history from which to draw clear lessons, um, except for the obvious ones. Um, so it would be hard to say, I think. One of the criticisms that my book has got is that while it ends on a hope of note by saying we can radically rethink this project, we can try to kind of get beyond the history, that nonetheless, it provides very little grounds for that hope throughout the book, that most of the details of the book are quite dour um, and pessimistic. Um, however, I think that the China example is an important and telling one, and it's an anomalous one in the book, where you see uh, uh, kind of um, mass mobilization being able to effectively change the terms of the game. And it wasn't simply because powerful nationalist officials started saying China needed to be treated differently. It was because of actual organized boycotts and protests and kind of um, action on the ground uh, in 1925 um, in reaction to kind of an incident of a police massacre in Shanghai that leads to this mass movement across China, kind of essentially demanding um, that uh, uh, kind of China's sovereignty be respected in new ways. And this has a huge effect actually in London. There's a kind of a fear of how this mass mobilization could kind of you know, uh, seriously wound British influence and prestige in the region. So a response um, is needed. So there are moments where coalitions, where mass mobilization, where kind of 
um, uh, emphasizing points of leverage, such as you know having control over access to vital raw materials and resources. There are moments when this kind of leverage can be productively mobilized um, with potent political effects. Um, but it's very, very difficult to do so. And I certainly wouldn't want to be the one in this room of policy-minded individuals to say exactly how it should be done. I think hopefully my, bo my book provides some historical grounds for um, you know, convincing you of the urgency of thinking anew and thinking very creatively. And I know that what, that's what the GDP Center is all about. Um, but uh, the road ahead, I think, will be quite a challenging one. Well, let's hear from the creative thinkers out here. Folks, we've got a, almost a half hour to, um, to engage with Professor Martin. Please uh, raise your hand, and why don't we take three or four at a time and let him, let him uh, field some questions. But please, uh, uh, he's a guest here, so tell us, uh, tell us your name and, and something about yourself, what program you're in, or something like that. And you see Mridu Khanna here from the GDP Center staff. She's going to ask you to, to speak, into, yes. speak into a microphone. Um, Who's going to break the ice for us? That's what I did. That was my role. I asked him three questions. Let's go. I have one in the front row here. <clears throat> so the microphone doesn't project your voice. It's just so people on YouTube can listen to you. So please project your voice for the people in the back of the room. <laughs> Should I? No, okay, I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just speak louder. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Kei Ta, and I'm a pre-doctoral fellow here at the GDP Center. A uh, very interesting talk, and thank you so much for introducing that. So, two questions. First, you mentioned that the first um, establishment of League of Nations is big of result of conflicts, hmm. of, of world war. I know this is probably too big uh, a guess, but the regional conflicts that we're seeing across the world um, in the recent even five years definitely increase the risk of you know, a broader conflict. So, okay, I know you, you hate doing the projection. <laughs> so if, if there's another global level conflicts happening, what would you see might be a difference from that time after the World War? And the second is you, your argument seems to follow, um, uh, um, you know, analysis of this war system between the central um, and the periphery countries that has been lasting for the last 100 years. Yeah. And if you're looking at the gap between the developed countries and global south, it's actually the gap is so big that you know they have to grow for 100 years at 10% GDP uh, per year, which makes it even harder to break that structure. Um, does that mean that, you know? I guess it's a similar question with Kevin. Uh, it's totally pessimistic and you know there's no hope. Mm. Take a couple. I'm sure historians, when they're when they're not around, all the rest of us are like, "Why do I always go to a room and I'm a historian and they ask me about the future?" Uh, other other it's questions. Quite fun though. Oh, yeah, I have oh, it. Hi, thank you for your talk. And I'm Rachel, and I'm a master's student. And I I actually have a, a historical question because you talked about a lot how China kind of fought against this global empire by like reestablishing their sovereignty. But I guess historically, I was curious about Japan because they were the first to kind of overthrow the unequal treaties. Mm. So how do they fit into like global economic governments? Because right mm. now the yen is kind of a staple currency mm. as well. So I was wondering if you did any comparisons between like the China case and the Japanese case. OK, we need one from this side of the room. Are these folks who are going to make you look bad? One or two more, and then we'll let them field, and yeah, we'll see how many rounds we can do. Front. Hi, I'm Arama Vasudevan from Colorado State University. I'm visiting. So I, had, uh, so I was really intrigued by the parallel um, between human rights and what you're talking because I think uh, uh, it's, quite, it's quite fascinating. And in particular, because when you think of human rights, the meddling becomes a way of maybe empowering democratic mm -hmm. movements against despotic regimes or undemocratic regimes. But when you think of finance, it becomes a way of actually constricting policy space. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the opposite thing. And, yeah. and, and the, kind of the, the kind of global logic of finance is particularly powerful. And what you, I mean, what you can yeah. see is 
uh, new forms of meddling evolving and using multilateral agencies as a cover yeah. or as a, or technocrats kind of arbitrating dispassionately in favor of finance yeah. as a way of pushing that agenda. Yeah. But you also see, for example, like in, in India, it's, it's really interesting because when the Human Rights Forum was created, in a commission was created in India, and, and there were international committees um, in the kind of late 90s, the finance minister was sent to the international body as part of the, <laughs> as a representative, right? And right now in the current context, when you see kind of, um, kind of rights violations happening in, in, in India, the fact that India is a, plays a particular role in the US-China mm. kind of geopolitical uh, maneuverings yeah. allows, yeah. A, 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 I mean, a blind eye to be turned. Yeah. Yeah. So that tension is, 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 is really intriguing. Yeah. And the second uh, kind of question is, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of these, um, um, as a historian, I mean, how far back, I mean, when, when you're digging, how far back do you go and where do you begin? I mean, hmm. I'm just intrigued because I find it's like a rabbit hole. You want to yeah, begin pursuing these questions. Yeah. You say, okay, yeah. it's the uh, yeah. League of Na Nations and the Ottoman Empire, but what about the Khedive yeah. regime yeah. in... Uh, in a, you know, and yep. and how, yep. so so how, I mean, so so how I mean, how far back does one go in trying to make sense of the current yep. moment? Yeah. All right. Well, we gave him five questions for the historian, <laughs> two about the future, one about the present, but he did get two about history. Uh, why don't we Why don't we take that and um, and hopefully we can get a, another round or two in. Well, I am a historian. However, I'm happy to try to answer all <laughs> questions, although some of them I can answer far less well than others. On the question of a future war. Um, that's one that I can't answer very well. What I can say is that history demonstrates that major wars tend to be very generative. Uh, they shake up the kind of the status quo, and out of that, often you get quite radically new um, kind of institutional arrangements. But of course, it depends who wins the war, um, and what shape those institutions will look like is, of course, completely determined by the victors and what the interests of the victors are. So the real answer to your question would only be possible, not only with the speculation of what the war would be, but who would win the war, of course. And, and that level of speculation is beyond my pay grade, I would say. Um, on the question of the kind of the, this kind of long durée of global inequality and relations between the center and periphery, I mean, I think you've put your finger on a huge problem. Perhaps it's, you know, my, lingering sy sympathy for world systems theory that makes me think that these core periphery relations, however, can, you know, they're always undergoing processes of change, and sometimes they can change rapidly and in unpredictable ways. So, you know, maybe you need 10% GDP growth over 100 years to kind of catch up. However, some kind of exogenous shock, if we can speak in these terms, might happen that would allow that process of catch up to be more rapid, and it might be a war itself, in fact. Um, on the question of Japan, now Japan plays a unique and somewhat limited role in my book, which generally focuses on the interwar period, uh, the First World War and the three decades or so following its aftermath. And at the beginning of this period, Japan is, of course, an ally. Japan fights in the, in the First World War on the side of Britain and France and the United States, and in the aftermath of the war, it's accorded certain privileges as a result of having chosen the winning side of the war. One of these privileges is, of course, uh, that it's able to hold on to uh, Chinese territory, something that leads to huge protests in China and kind of huge kind of explosion of political mobilization in China. Um, but the uh, Japanese are kind of given seats at the table. They participate in the economic work of the League of Nations. They're present at the foundation of the Bank for International Settlements, and so on and so forth. They're not major players, however, in the economic uh, kind of functions of these institutions. They're not kind of usually um, kind of standing um, at the center of discussions about how to create them and endow them with powers. Now, in the 1930s, the story about Japan, of course, changes quite dramatically. And uh, in the 1930s, Japan obviously quickly leaves the League of Nations. Japan kind of, you know, forms um, a, a kind of, uh, a kind of um, 
you know, uh, leads opposition to the kind of liberal internationalism at the heart of these kinds of institutions. So the story changes quite dramatically. And of course, it's Japanese opposition to the League of Nations acting in China that proves to be the principal stumbling block for this program at all. Now, on the question of the relationship between kind of human rights and this kind of financial interventionism or something like that. Um, you know, I made that claim in my talk, and it's a claim that I like to make um, because I think it has some kind of, you know, it's provocative perhaps. But there's also very deep historical ties between these two things. So in the aftermath of the First World War, the League of Nations, the, the two areas in which the League of Nations is able to actually wield quite muscular powers in domestic arenas. One is in the arenas of finance in a limited number of states, Austria, Bulgaria, Hungary. The other is over this question of minority rights. And minority rights are kind of generally seen you know, as something of a predecessor to human rights. Minority rights are not uh, rights given to individuals to kind of protect them from the you know, encroachment of the state, um, but they're rights given to national groups or ethnic groups. Um, and this causes enormous controversy because the League is seen as essentially getting involved in domestic problems in some countries, generally new countries in Eastern Europe, um, where the League is kind of takes on the mantle of protector of certain minority groups within those countries. Um, and you see a very similar kind of political dynamic. The countries where um, these minority treaty regimes are applied are upset that these re treaty regimes don't apply everywhere. They don't apply to African Americans in the United States. The United States would, ne you know, never agrees to allow this treaty regime to kind of uh, influence the treatment of U.S. Uh, citizens. Um, so they're unevenly applied. They involve quite far-reaching or potentially quite far-reaching interventions in very, very fraught domestic political issues. Um, and something similar, of course, happens in the financial realm. So one of the kind of claims of the book is that you see the evolution of these two quite different things kind of um, uh, uh, the, the, the questions that they pose for sovereignty and asymmetries in the international system are tied together from the beginning. Um, now, on this other question of how far back do you have to go to understand the dynamics that you know, we've been speaking about today, of course, you could keep going back further and further and further. You know, it's turtles all the way down, and historians you know, were often inclined to just keep saying, no, don't stop there. There's another precedent. There's another precedent. Of course, empire is very, very, very old. The, the place that I stop my story, you know, the farthest back I really go, is to say that there's a new kind of empire that emerges in the 19th century, um, a meaningfully different form of informal financial imperialism, a kind of power that bondholders and the representative of bondholders um, are able to wield um, over many different states, including Egypt, as you mentioned, and the Ottoman Empire and elsewhere. And this is the crucial context for understanding 20th century innovations, that it's an attempt to remake these practices from the 19th century to a world that is changing quite dramatically in the 20th century. And this tension between these old 19th century assumptions and practices, quite coercive, and a 20th century international order that is founded, or at least theoretically founded, on the expansion of sovereignty claims, on great growing democratization, that it's this tension that continues to kind of um, plague us today. We're supposed to have a reception from 5 to 5.30, but uh, let's take two, two more questions, and then we'll uh, Professor Martin have a, have a last word, and then we've got a short reception we'll have in here, and, and we, can, we can have the conversation more, more informally. And not uh, the, the five point questions that we got <laughs> from the people in the front row. Um, thank you so much for your time. And this was a very interesting conversation. I am, my name is Greta, and I'm a, par a student at the Party School. Um, my question goes off of what Professor Gallagher and you mentioned before uh, when you mentioned uh, regional arrangements and swap lines being means that developed countries have to help one another during uh, um, economic distress. And, and these means of, are not directly provided uh, to uh, uh, developing countries, which would eventually resort to um, the IMF. So um, going off of this, 
um, we're trying to understand how to change the global economic governance so by finding a way to vault these countries out of poverty, of empire, right? And so how do we leverage resources internally so that we decrease uh, their dependency uh, on the outside? And this is a question that we're trying to uh, tackle and to answer. And uh, when we went to the, uh, with my colleagues to the United Nations uh, last month, we went to visit the Nigerian mission and um, a Nigeria, a Nigerian uh, official working for the Fourth Commission, Economic Commission, mentioned that an idea that they have been putting forward at the UN is an international tax to be imposed on countries that come to Africa to extract resources, get energy, or whatever. Um, so I was wondering, have you observed in the past any instances uh, whereby developing countries have put forward this idea of having an international tax imposed on countries coming to them. Um, I don't want to get too specific mm. here, but I, I was just interested to understand whether this is uh, a more recent idea that is arising or whether it can be related to something that actually you know, what was discussed in the past. Yeah. No, One more quickie and then we'll let him have his, his last word. Hello, uh, I'm Wen Tao, currently an undergrad student studying uh, econ and IR. So what I'm really interested in is, you know, uh, when the modelers come in to like prefer liberal countries, um, at first, you know, they'll be pretty say, submissive to, you know, uh, any kind of initiatives, you know, they put forward. But I wonder like at what point, you know, the domestic politics will start react yeah. to see this as a, you know, intervention event. Yeah. Uh, is it coming from more of a reaction from the, you know, the population, and then uh, from the bottom to up, and then sort of uh, becomes a, you know, reaction, uh, like a reaction against it, or is it actually the political institution that actually, you know, use it as an opportunity to, you know, for political game yeah. to, you know, get in positions and yeah. stuff, yeah. yep. Yeah, yeah thank you, um, these, are, these are fascinating questions. Now, in the, the historical research that I've done, I have not seen in these much earlier contexts kind of coalitions of countries in what would later be called the Global South banding together to try to create these new international tax regimes. Uh, that's not to say that that didn't exist. I haven't seen it in my own research, but you know, um, it would be very interesting to discover. There were kind of discussions and policy proposals over you know, ways of dealing internationally with tax evasion and things like that, or with double taxation, but that's quite a different set of issues. Now, of course, many countries would, you know, uh, facing foreign businesses laying claim to natural resources or erecting regimes of concessions would nationalize you know, their resources and attempt to kind of um, bring themselves out from under the control of these foreign companies, but I haven't seen, you know, in this kind of interwar 1940s context, these ideas. I, I think it's a later innovation. Now, on this question of the reaction, so the meddlers come, generates a backlash. Well, who's leading the backlash? It varies. Now, in some cases, you see something, you know, that looks more like a popular reaction. In other cases, you have precisely what you're describing. You have political elites that actually want this regime of austerity to be implemented because they recognize that, hey, actually, this is going to be helpful for containing runaway inflation. But we don't have the political backing to do it ourselves. So this external force is a kind of a scapegoat. So you, you see this in, in some cases where there's this constant game being played where the international institution is blamed, but the government never does enough to fully make itself ineligible for further resources, right? And it often simply depends on the nature of the political party in power, the nature of its opposition, how much power it has, and how risky that game is. Because in some countries, that game is just too risky. If it has a very organized, say, nationalist opposition to the sitting government, how much could you actually expect to get away with 
buying this political cover for your very, very controversial programs. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Well, thanks. Before I invite everyone to uh, uh, reception to continue this conversation on a more personal level, let me just uh, tell you that we're just kicking the semester off here at the JDP Center. So out here in the reception, we have QR codes where you can find out about some of our other events. We have a big event that we co-sponsor with the Economics Department every semester called the Paul Street and Distinguished Lecture. This year we're going to have Eswar Prasad. That's on March 29th. Uh, we're uh, doing a, an event in April with the, uh, with the African Studies Center, uh, bringing Daniel Runda to talk about his new book, uh, probably Catherine Weaver from Brown University, and our own um, Jorge Heine on his book on how, to a certain extent, Developing countries are trying to mm. counter some of these uh, some of these uh, rising powers. We only touch the iceberg here. Touch the iceberg. That's not the right word. We only touch touch the surface here. Uh, you really have to read read this book, The Meddlers. It's got not only in, incredible stories that you'll just talk about for a long time, but it tells uh, tells it, it has a lot of big lessons for us. I encourage you all to read The Meddlers, and please uh, please uh, help me in in thanking Professor Martin for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. We have to get untied from our microphones. We'll join you in there in a second, but we've got a, a light reception in here. We can continue the conversation. Thanks. 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 That was great.